Welcome, my dear students and viewers, to my continuing coverage in Chapter 3 of Stoichiometry and Chemical Equations. In this video, I will teach you about Avogadro's number and atomic weights versus formula weights. So, before we can really use chemical equations, we have to balance them. We do this by adding coefficients in front or to the left of each formula in the equation until the total number of each atom type is equal on both sides. Now, the best way for me to show you how to do this is to actually take you to the board and show you how to do this. So let's start with some example problems. I want you to please balance each of the following equations. Now, you're welcome to pause the video here and try it on your own. You can then hit play and watch me show you the answer on the board. Whenever I balance chemical equations, I always look at both sides of the reaction. Here's the reaction, left side, right side. And then I make a little table of all of the elements going left to right that appear on each side. I look left to right, I've got a carbon, and then I've got a bunch of oxygens. So I'll go ahead and do that on the left. On the right, I have the same elements. Then what you have to do is you have to add coefficients, that is numbers, to the left of each of these substances. And you have to do it in whatever way is necessary in order to make the same number of carbons on both sides and the same number of oxygens on both sides total. One thing you cannot do, please, please remember this, you cannot change these subscripts. That two, that two, you can't change them. Any of the ones that are here and are implied, you cannot change those numbers because that would change the chemical identity of those substances. You can only change, take away, or add coefficients, the numbers uh, to the left of each of these substances. So let's go ahead and look at this. Um, I think one of the challenging things that we're going to see right here is that I've got an even number of oxygens here on the right and I've got an odd number on the left. So I've got two here, and I've got on the, and I'll go ahead and write down two here on the right, and I've got one, two, three here on the left. Three oxygens on the left. Whenever you have that kind of thing where you've got an even and an odd issue, the best way to resolve it is to go ahead and put a two next to uh, whichever the substances has the odd number uh, of atoms. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now what happens is this. I have two multiplied through, which means I've got two carbon atoms and I have two oxygen atoms. Now when I add that, uh, th these two oxygen atoms here, that gives me a total number of oxygen atoms, total, total, total on the left of four. So I, ha I have four total oxygen atoms on the left. Now let's take a look here to the right. If I look to the right, you'll notice I only have one carbon atom. Can I change that? Well, I totally can. If I put a two right there, that two multiplies through, now I have two carbon atoms on the left, but guess what? It changes the number of oxygen atoms. These twos multiply by each other, so the number of oxygen atoms on the right is four. I now have the same number of carbon atoms on both the left and the right sides of the equation, as well as oxygen atoms. And that chemical equation is stoichiometrically balanced. Cha-ching! For this one, we'll follow the same process as we did the last one. Looking at the left side of the equation, going left to right, I've got a carbon atom. I also have hydrogen atom. And I keep moving over here, I've got a chlorine atom. Over here on the right, I've got a carbon atom, and presumably I've got some hydrogens and chlorines. If we look over here, total, total, we can see we've got one carbon atom, we've got four hydrogen atoms, and I've got two chlorine atoms. Okay, how many carbons do I have on the right? Well, I've got one. How many hydrogens? I've got one. And how many chlorines? Well, I've got one, two, three, four, five. So I've got five uh, chlorines. My carbons are balanced, my hydrogens are not. What in the world can I do? Well, I could put a four right there, now that changes the number of hydrogens to be four. My hydrogens now match. But what about my chlorine atoms? Well, see, that four also changes these number of chlorines because it multiplies through. So now I've got four chlorines here plus four chlorines here, which comes to eight. So I have eight chlorine atoms on the right. I only have two on the left. Can I somehow fix that? That two is the only problem we've got. If I multiply this by four, that four multiplied by that two, and now I've got Indeed, eight chlorine atoms. So that is a balanced stoichiometric equation. Booyah! Now I'm going to teach you about Avogadro's number. What in the world is a mole? So we chemists often use this thing called a mole to measure stuff. So what is a mole? Well, strictly defined, a mole, which is also called Avogadro's number, is this number. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, which I recommend you memorize. It's kind of like a dozen, except instead of being 12, it's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, which, by the way, is a huge number. Now, why in the world would we care about such a bizarre number? Well, as it turns out, a mole happens to be the exact number of atoms present in a sample that weighs that element's atomic weight. For example, if we look at carbon's atomic weight on the periodic table, we will see that it is 12.0107. Now, this means that if you had exactly 12.0107 grams of carbon in your hand, 
then you would be holding exactly 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms. Make sense? So whatever the atomic mass is of an element, one mole or this many atoms of that element equals that many grams of that element. So let's do another example. The atomic weight of magnesium is 24.3050. Now this means that if you had exactly 24.3050 grams of magnesium in your hand, then you would be holding exactly 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd magnesium atoms. Make sense? Ooh, let's do another one. Okay, so let's look at xenon. Its atomic weight is 131.293. Thus, if you had exactly 131.293 grams of xenon in your hand, then you would be holding, you guessed it, exactly 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd xenon atoms. Make sense? Good. Let's do a lecture problem. So what is the mass in grams of exactly 1.0 moles of carbon-12? Okay, this is kind of a tricky problem, trickier than you might think. So you might look at the periodic table and think, hey, carbon has an atomic weight of 12.0107. Well, that's true, but you might remember from an earlier video where I taught you that this number is not the true mass of any individual carbon atom. There, there's no carbon atom on Earth that, or anywhere that we know of that weighs 12.0107. This is a weighted average that takes into account the different weights of different isotopes of carbon, as well as their individual percent abundances. Thus, most carbons are carbon-12s. What I'm telling you is that if you had exactly 1.00000 moles of only carbon-12s, no carbon-13s, no carbon-14s, nothing but 12s, what would the mass in grams be of the sample in your hand? Yeah, it would be exactly 12. Does that make sense? Good. Here's another one. How many carbon atoms are present in exactly one mole of carbon-12? Yeah, if you had exactly one mole of carbon-12, the number of atoms is Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms. Now, as it turns out, the answer here would be exactly the same, even if you swapped out carbon-12 here for any other atom. If you have exactly one mole of any atom, you have this exact number of that atom. And if you had one mole of skateboards, you would have this exact number of skateboards and so forth and so on. Exciting? I hope so. Now I move to this subject, molecular, also called formula weights. I begin by asking you, do molecules like NaCl, sodium chloride, have atomic weights? Well, as it turns out, the answer is no. You see, when we talk about the weight of a molecule, which is something that's made of two or more atoms bonded together, we are no longer talking about atomic weight. We are instead talking about a molecular weight. In other words, it's just a slight difference in terminology. We use the term atomic weight to refer to individual atoms, but anytime you have a molecule, that is a substance made of two or more atoms bonded together in their formula, we use the term molecular weight. So that's the difference between atomic weight versus molecular weight. Slight vocab difference, but important nonetheless. Now, molecular weights are also sometimes called formula weights or molar masses. So what is the molecular weight of sodium chloride? Well, if you look at the periodic table, you'll see that sodium's atomic weight is 22.98976, whereas chlorine's is 35.453. Now, each individual molecule of sodium chloride has just one sodium and one chlorine. So, to determine the molecular weight of an NaCl, all you do is add one of this number together with one of this number. In other words, 22.98976 plus 35.453. You add that together and you get this answer. Now, using our proper significant figure rounding rules for addition, which I discussed in an earlier video, linked to in the description below, you would get this number, 58.443. This of course means that if you had 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of sodium chloride, then it would weigh 58.443 grams. Now, as an important note to end this video, please remember, my dear students, that atomic and molecular weights units are grams per mole. Now, I know I tell you in an earlier video that we sometimes use atomic mass units as the units for our atomic weights, and that's acceptable as well. But for the vast majority of calculations that involve atomic weights or molecular weights, these units are actually better, grams per mole. So I beg you, my students, please memorize that. One mole of sodium chloride weighs 58.443. Hence, sodium chloride's molecular weight is 58.443 grams per mole.